Welcome to the Daily Update, or go over the action in the market for Thursday, March 7th, and then we'll see how things look for Friday, March 8th. We set another new all-time high with the S&P and the NASDAQ, but we did it on a decrease in volume. We were below average with volume. That is always a concern. There are some things that we want to be aware of, yet at the same time, when you're setting new all-time highs, that's a very positive thing. It's like the markets are asking seasonality, what's that? We should be going through a period of weak seasonality right now. At least historically, that has been what has happened. But the market just keeps going up and up and up. Now the debate is going back and forth. Are we in a bubble? Are things getting too out of hand to the upside? And I have some information to share with you just to kind of reach your own conclusion with that later on. So let's go back and talk about what happened. Right at the open, it was interesting. The futures were actually negative. When I recorded the video for yesterday, we were down about a quarter of a percent. Right when Europe opened, that's when things started to really shift. Europe wasn't really that strong. One of their indexes was up pretty strong. That goes across the whole EU. But each individual country wasn't doing all that well. And that really gave some support to the U.S. stock futures. And then by the time we opened, we had a higher open above R1 at 51.24. We also got above R2 at 51.44. As the day went on, we briefly stalled at the previous intraday high at the Van Halen number of 51.50. That was the intraday high that we set recently. We stalled out at that point for a little while, and it looked like, okay, maybe we're going to fall back. Then we ended up climbing above that. We got up to 51.66, right around the 51.65 level, and we ended up closing near the high for the day. We were up 1.03% on below average volume. That is a concern. We are positive. We're starting to become more overbought now, especially in the short term. Our list is kind of long of the usual suspects. We're becoming more overbought in the intermediate term. We remain overbought when you just look at the moving averages in the long term. But at the same time, price going up is positive in and of itself because price is the ultimate indicator. The markets really like where inflation and interest rates are at right now. They'd like interest rates to be lower, and they're thinking that's what's going to happen. But we're still maintaining that Goldilocks look when it comes to the economy, of course, We've got the State of the Union address that's pretty much being done about the time I'm recording this, so I can't really react to that. That doesn't have much of an impact on the markets, and there's other geopolitical events as well that the market just doesn't really seem to be paying attention to. Some comments. Both the S&P and the NASDAQ hit new all-time highs, and we saw more of a broad market advance. Not an awful lot of strength when we look at our charts. But we did see it pretty widespread. The mega caps and semiconductor stocks, they were quite strong in Thursday's session. And then Fed Chair Powell gave the second day of his semi-annual testimony. He first appeared before the House yesterday. Now he bef appeared before the Senate today. Really didn't say anything new. The prepared remarks were the same. The Q&A, that's usually where the market tries to figure out, okay, what's he really thinking? That really didn't offer any surprises. We're still going with this idea that it will likely be appropriate to lower rates later this year, but we don't know what that means as far as a time frame or by how much. And there is also speculation that the European Central Bank may cut rates later this year. That gave support to European stocks because we're not really dealing with any major catastrophes right now. Yes, there's wars going on and there's always problems, but we're talking about events like 9-11, the great financial crisis, the COVID lockdowns. And so the markets are looking at rate cuts as being more friendly. Now, as I have been saying, that could change. Some event could happen where the Fed has to come in and the European Central Bank and other banks in fact, Japan's looking at possibly raising their rates, but something could happen to trigger an emergency type situation where the economy needs to be stimulated and they do that by cutting rates. But we can only go with what's happening right now. None of those events have really played out, at least to this point, but we always have to be aware of that. 
Here's our short-term list, and it's becoming a little longer. The usual indicators that we have, the Williams percent are the CCI 14 and 20, the stochastics, which was the only thing on the list yesterday. The standard deviations chart, we're up into that plus three channel. And the boom indicator based on 20 periods, we're getting a little far away from that 20 period moving average. Also a little bit of an increase here. The Arun is starting to look a little extreme in the intermediate term. Our oscillators, they're pretty much flatlining, but they're still giving us extreme positive readings. The Sean trend meter, the boom, that should be 50 instead of 20. We're getting kind of far away from that moving average as well. And then this has been on the list for a while, the 10 period new high, new low study based on the S&P. And then our long-term moving averages, the 150 and 200s, that's in the long-term. And we're still dealing with this scenario that the Fed's pretty much said that they're done raising rates. Now, that's barring any kind of strange thing happening. It's just the way things are unfolding right now. And that at some point in the future, probably in 2023, I've heard as few as two rate cuts, as many as four rate cuts, depending on who you talk to. Everybody's trying to speculate about that. Anywhere from 25 basis points up to three quarters of a percent. So, and that's going to go flying around and people like to have that stuff, you know, offering their opinion about things. But we just kind of have to watch this play out and then see it unfold here. The dollar was down and interest rates were also down. They spent the morning part being up, but they really didn't put a lot of pressure on stocks. They ended up coming down. We closed at 4.09% for the 10-year yield. The yield curves that we still follow are inverted. The average time after they go back to being more normal is about five months. That's when we start the, the countdown to see if we go into a recession after that. And you have folks that are still completely convinced that we're going to go into a recession. You have other folks that think, no, we're going to have a soft landing. We're not going to go into a recession. That's what the market's thinking right now. But as things shift and move around, we'll see how it actually ends up playing out. We just want to be aware of that. Sentiment is back to extreme positive. We came in at 75. We had ticked down to 74. With the update, we're looking a little extreme. We could still go higher than this. We have the major economic report of the month coming out in Friday's session. That'll be the employment situation report. And how the market reacts to that could really have an impact on sentiment. Our trend is still positive. It's still dropping below its moving average. And so it's weakening, but we're still in a trending environment since the ADX is above 20. The green line's starting to get close to 40 again. We're positive with the bias with the update, and our momentum is now by okay let me try that again our momentum continues to be positive over the last two three four five days economic reports that came out we had the weekly jobless claims they came in as expected at two hundred seventeen thousand. the continuing claims are at 1.906 million and i have charts to show you of this fourth quarter productivity growth came in at 3.2 percent a little bit more than the 3.1 percent they had expected last time it did come in at 3.2 percent Unit labor costs came in lower than expected, so they're producing more, but it's costing companies less, and the market likes that. They expected it to come in at 0.6%. It came in up 0.4%. Last time, it was up half a percent. The trade deficit, which is always negative, came in at a minus 67.4 billion. That's more than the minus 63.3 billion that, we, that the market thought was going to happen. And last time, we saw minus 64.2 billion. Consumer credit really shot up. Are folks having to live off their credit cards or off their home equity lines of credit and things like that? The If you talk to the current administration, they say the economy is doing great. If you talk to the average person, they're having some problems. And a lot of folks are really having to increase the amount of debt that they're taking on right now. So it was up $19.5 billion. They expected it to only be up 10 billion. Last time it was up 0.9 billion. Here are some charts. Here's the weekly jobless claims where we're seeing a little bit of a difference here. We were flat, but we're above the moving average when we look at the score just for this week. But the moving average continues to decline. Here are the continuing claims where both are going up. We're seeing the increase in continuing claims as well as the moving average going up as well. Here's a chart showing all of them together. 
with the initial claims, continuing claims, and we're going to get an update of the unemployment rate in Friday's session. I tried to break it down to make it a little easier to read, where it just shows you all of these different things happening at the same time. Then looking at non-farm productivity, productivity and unit labor costs, where we're coming down with costs and we're going up with productivity. I mean, could you ask for anything better than that from an economic standpoint when you're a shareholder and when you're operating a company? If you're an employee, you kind of want it the other way around. You want to be able to do less and get paid more. Looking at consumer credit year over year, even though we saw it really spike up, it's still continuing to go down. And then, but on a month over month basis, it really shot up. A couple of charts here, looking at the forward multiple, looking out into the future. When we take the S&P together, we're still at around that 20 level for the PE ratio. So that's suggesting that the market is expensive. When you take the equal weight, which also set a new all-time high in Thursday's session, it's at 16 times earnings. That's because the big Magnificent Seven stocks, they carry a much higher P.E. ratio. And then new orders to inventory ratio says the ISM rising to 55 in the next three months. What they do is they push it forward with the new orders, and then that tends to help the ISM reading. And so they're looking at this improving and getting above 50, which is showing some, some expansion in the economy. This is one of the parts I was talking about. Are we in a bubble or not? Some of you may have heard of Ray Dalio. He's a real rock star when it comes to hedge funds. He's kind of the Warren Buffett of hedge funds. And when he talks, people listen, just like with Jamie Dimon. You may agree or disagree, but the market pays attention to him, even though they may say things that we already know. But when they say it, it seems to add extra importance to this. I'm not going to read all this to you. You may want to pause this and just kind of read this. This is six points that he came up with for how to identify if we are, in fact, in a bubble. Then the tweet that went along with this, and I will read through this. It says, I've seen a lot of bubbles in my time and have studied even more in history. And there are books on this that I would recommend people read to go back to the tulips and the, uh, what was it, the Victoria Company. There have been manias that have gone on for hundreds of years almost pretty much thousands of years. And so he considers himself to be an authority when it comes to evaluating whether we're in a bubble or not. He says he created his own bubble indicator. And concluding with this, he says, we are not in a bubble right now. Now, you could watch a bunch of YouTube videos, turn on some of the financial media, and there's people saying that this is bubble mania. But according to him, we're not in a bubble. And this is another thing that goes along with that. I actually went and clicked on the link here. He created his own bubble gauge. Isn't that nice? And we see the reading over here on the right where it's not as high as it was in the past. So according to how he measures things, we still have a ways to go before we're in bubble territory. Each of us need to make our own decisions and come to our own conclusions about whether we think we're in a bubble or not. But according to him, we are not. Here's our intraday chart. We gapped above R1, we got up to R2, and then this is where we stalled out at the Van Halen level, right around 5150. That was the previous intraday high. And we chopped along that for quite a while, but then we were able to break above it. We came back down, but then we closed slightly off of the high for the day. Here's our intraday chart where we were seeing some negativity in the initial overnight session. But then once Europe opened up and it looked like, okay, there's rumors flying around that they may be cutting rates this year as well. And the European markets really took that as positive news. That helped the U.S. futures to really go up. That helped give us the gap higher open. And we're not seeing much of a change right now in the initial overnight session. This is another little concern. We're not seeing the blue line above the red line. It was there for a while on an intraday basis, but growth is not really outperforming value. That's just a warning sign. Doesn't mean the market can't go up. I mean, the, the red line and the blue line are right on top of each other by the time we close and we're going up. So that can still happen. It's when we see the real strength is when the blue line is above the red line and we're Showing some improvement here with our growth to value ratio for the S&P on the intraday chart. 
it trailed off a little bit going into the close, but this is bouncing back up, but it's not breaking out above these previous ranges. Now, when we had that solid down date, we saw the growth to value ratio really decline. So it is showing some improvement since we saw that pullback. Here's our end of day charts. Growth was up quite a bit more than value for the large caps. It was also up more for the mid caps, but up less for the small caps. And when we look at our end of day chart here for the growth to value ratio for the small caps, we're still looking good here. We broke out and we're maintaining a lot of these gains. We're just not seeing much of that in the index. The small caps were up, but they're not really breaking out right now. We're seeing a little bit of a bounce back up and a longer term uptrend with the mid cap growth to value ratio. And we're seeing more improvement here with the mid cap index. Here's the S&P growth to value ratio end of day where it is turning back up, but has not been able to get above this high. But overall, this has been going up and we're in a longer term uptrend. This is another area of disappointment. Discretionary to staples, that ratio actually declined, even though we're still in a longer term uptrend. We want to see that going up. Here's our trend. We're still falling below the moving average, suggesting that we're in a weakening trending environment, but we are above 20, so we are trending. The green line is starting to turn back up and we're just barely below 40. When we get above 40, that's when we start to get a little concerned with any of these lines, whether it's the red line, green line, or the ADX itself. In the short term, also turning back up and slightly above 40 with the green line also declining with the ADX and the red line is also declining as well. We did drop off a little bit with volume. That is a concern. Here we are sitting all time, setting all time highs and we're seeing a decrease in volume. That's like technical analysis 101 warning sign. But we've been seeing that a lot lately, but the market still keeps going up. The ulcer index is showing there's not a lot of fear. We did tick down a little bit with the VIX when we look at the line chart and the bar chart, but we're still above the moving averages. And lately, the VIX is still in this longer term uptrend. When we look at both of these charts, we've been setting a series of higher lows since about the beginning of December. We came down a little bit with the volatility of the VIX because of the update. We're just a little bit below the moving averages with the bar chart and the line chart. The MACD is starting to turn back up on a momentum basis. We haven't quite crossed above the moving average yet. When the VIX was coming down and stocks were going up, we saw the momentum start to decrease. But now the VIX is starting to go back up, so we could see the momentum turning back up as well. Here's the one-day equity put call ratio. It really declined after it spiked up after Wednesday's session. Now it came down. And so when we look at our five period, it's kind of hard to see, but we are starting to turn back down with our five period simple moving average of the equity put call ratio. We did get the latest reading of the American Association of Individual Investors. They're not quite extreme positive, but they're pretty optimistic. This was a week ago. If we end up finishing really solid in Friday's session, this is probably going to go higher even next week. So we're starting to get extreme with this indicator. Looking at our advanced decline line, we're looking really solid here. The advanced decline line based on price and volume are breaking out for the S&P. We did increase the number of new highs and we saw a contraction of the new lows, but we're still rolling over with our, with our five period, but we're going up with our 10 period moving average. We're positive with the advanced decline ratio. We're turning back up with the accumulation distribution. This is supposed to be a smart money indicator, but we're still declining with another smart money indicator, the shaken money flow. It is continuing to go down. Now it's still positive, but it has been declining when we've been seeing up days. Shaken oscillator ticked up a little bit, is declining, but still above zero. This is a chart that I've never shown before. I've been following it for a while and I wanted to wait until something was actually happening. I usually show this when it applies to the NYSE. This is the cumulative advanced decline line for the S&P, where we are breaking out based on price. We are showing some improvement here based on volume, but we haven't broken out above these previous highs yet, set, set back in 2021. So a little bit of a longer term negative divergence there. When we look at the NYSE common stock, we're looking better here. We're breaking out based on price, breaking out based on volume, where volume had been lagging, but we're not back to the previous highs that we set before. So looking at our advanced decline line studies, we're breaking out and looking solid with the NYSE, the S&P, the mid caps. 
We showed some improvement with the small caps, but we have not been able to break out yet. Here's our daily chart. We were able to get back above this longer term trend line. I have another breakout chart to show you that. We did see a decrease in volume to below average. And we might have overdone it on a one day from Wednesday to Thursday. We're up to this blue line. Now we could go higher than this, but this is meaning that we went up pretty far pretty fast. So here's our Williams percent R, one of the usual short term indicators that is getting extreme positive. The CCI 14, the CCI 20, we're getting far away from the 20 period moving average with the boom indicator and the 50 period moving average with the boom indicator. We are going back up with the 20, 50, and 200 period moving averages, but the exponential moving averages are not extreme positive yet. We did see some improvement and we're crossing back above the midpoint with the force index. We're getting extreme again with the short, short term stochastics. We're turning back up and getting extreme in the intermediate term. We remain extreme positive in the long term. And as I explained from time to time, this is a further subdivision of the short term time frame. We are getting extreme with our standard deviations chart. We're up into the plus three channel. Intermediate term, we're still declining with the balance of power, but it's above the midpoint. So it's still positive. We've switched back to the darker blue bar with the go no go system. And we're coming back up to the blue line here with our highest high value as price is advancing. The TTM squeeze is turning back more positive to the lighter shade of blue. And we still are kind of going flat here with the ease of movement. And uh, it's still positive since it's above zero, but you'd think that would go up a little more than it did. The Arun indicator is showing some improvement and starting to get to the point where we often see an extreme positive reading. We're still looking more positive with the S&P McClellan oscillator, still watching this longer term negative divergence, but we're going up with the summation index based on price and volume, also keeping an eye on this longer term negative divergence, improving with the NYSE McClellan oscillator, also negative divergence, the summation index based on price and volume are going up, and we're seeing volume actually looking stronger, and that's a good solid sign right there. It's moving up with a lot more conviction than what we're seeing price right now. So that, that is positive. The Swindon Trading Oscillator is positive based on price and volume. We're above zero. But our oscillators are just like, eh, we're not quite sure what to do here. But when we look at this based on price and volume, we continue to be positive. We saw a bit of an improvement with the PMOs that are rising. The buy signals, a little bit of an improvement. And we're still continuing to go up with the PMOs above zero. We've switched from being neutral back over to positive with the Elder's Impulse system. We're positive with the parabolic SAR. Here we're trying to turn back up with our slope oscillator. We're coming back up and right about on the moving average with the MACD. So you can see all of this. We're getting extreme readings from all of these oscillators, but they're just flatlining as they're getting gyrated around. They're not really picking up any kind of serious momentum. If we have an up day, they look a little more positive. If we have a down day, they look a little bit more negative. We're still above all of the plotted moving averages here. We're above the 20 period moving average and we bounced off the QQQ or NASDAQ 100 20 day moving average. And that so far has been providing support also for the S&P 500. We're looking a little better with the bullish percent index. Now we are starting to get extreme. We're above 70, but as long as this keeps going up, that is positive. We ticked up just a little bit with the NYSE bullish percent index, and we're showing a little bit of an improvement with the NASDAQ 100 bullish percent index. The money flow is above 50. And it's flat lining a little bit here, but it's continuing to go up. We're turning back up with the ultimate oscillator. That's positive. We're seeing a decline here with the Vortex. It's positive, but it has been declining on an up day, and we've been seeing that a little bit lately. We're not extreme with the RSI 14 or 9. We're still looking positive overall. We're above 50. On balance volume, now this is one of the first technical indicators to ever be developed, and it was way back in the 60s by a guy named Joseph Granville, I think his name was. And the way this is calculated is, is if we have an up day, all of the volume is positive. If we have a down day, all of the volume is negative. So that's why you see more of these choppy indicators. I didn't use this indicator for a long time, but a lot of the indicators that I use are based on this indicator. So it helps us to be able to look at this. Because we had an up day, we're still seeing some improvement here. 
And we're looking a little better with our 20 period moving averages. Yeah, you could still say we're seeing a negative divergence as the S&P has been going up, but this is also showing some improvement. We're also seeing some improvement with the 200 period moving average study. And these are stocks inside of the S&P. We're showing some improvement here, but a little bit more pronounced negative divergence with the 50 period moving average study. The copy curve is trying to cross back above its moving average, so it's turning slightly positive. We're going up and starting to get extreme with the Sean trend meter. Here's our charts. These just measure mo the different trend. We're turning back positive with the hike in Ashi. We're turning back positive with the Kegi. It's now turned back over to black. The Renko never did see any problems. It's positive. And the three-line break is also turning back positive. This is a warning sign, though. We're looking really good with the point and figure chart, but maybe a little too good. We had a new signal triggered here, which is a long top, it's really hard to read, up move. This maybe suggests that we're going up kind of far, kind of fast. And the point and figure chart doesn't really like that all that much, that maybe things are getting out of control. This might suggest that maybe we're seeing some kind of a bubble no matter what Ray Dalio says. Now, we can see these signals for quite a while. If we see a bit of a pullback, we'll see if that alert ends up changing. Long-term, we were able to recapture the short-term trend line where we had spent a couple of days below it. We closed just a little bit above it. We are coming up to a new 50-day cycle that will be happening Thursday, March 14th. This is the weekly chart here with the pivot points that last for a whole month. We're now back above this R1 level. We hit it once and then back, back down. We were able to close above it a week ago. We came back down. Now we're back above this. There's a real tug of war going on right at this point that still has yet to resolve itself. For right now, the bulls are winning. If we have a down day, the bears will be going back to winning. Here's our 150 and 200 moving averages showing that we are extreme. Looking at the indexes, we're still positive with the Keller market model across all time frames and all of the different indexes. We were all blue or green with our alerts being triggered with the S&P setting a new all time high. And here's the equal weight, which is holding up fairly well and setting a new all time high in and of itself. Even though the mega caps did better, the equal weight index has been really showing some improvement here we did tick up a little bit with our ratio meaning that the mega caps outperformed but we're still seeing a real lag with the transports we're just going up 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 with the s p we're going down 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 when we look at the ratio between the transports and the s p that could be longer term positive that at some point the market will decide to deal with the Dow is still just a little bit above this pivot point, and it was up, not by very much, but it was still up. And we've gone from being negative back to neutral with the diamonds, where the NASDAQ, it's setting a new all-time high here, and is looking pretty solid right now. We're coming up to this R1 level. We may see some overhead resistance with the NASDAQ 100, but it is still looking rather positive. We're positive with the QQQs when looking at the Elder's Impulse system. And we're trying to turn back up above the moving average, but we're still just slightly negative. You could make a case that we're slightly positive now with the momentum for the NASDAQ 100. We're starting to break a little bit further above this long-term ratio between the NASDAQ 100 and the Dow. If we can keep going up, that would be more positive. If we really start to turn and go down, that could be more longer-term negative. The small caps, eh, they were up, but not by very much, and they're not really breaking out with the S&P index that we follow. And we switch back over to positive with the Elder's Impulse system for the small caps. The Russell also was up and showing a little bit of an improvement here, but we closed right near the low for the day on the bar. But the RSI is positive, the trend is positive, and the momentum is positive for the small caps. The mid caps did break above R1. They're looking a little stronger right now, and they are positive with the Elder's Impulse system for the mid caps. Here's another ratio from the NASDAQ 100 or the QQQs to the IWM, which are the small caps. We're coming back up just a little bit here below this line. That's kind of an extreme reading. We're going to watch to see if this can start to go back up or is this going to continue to fall down. 
And we're still concerned about this. Google is still dealing with its 200-day moving average. It was able to recapture that on Thursday. Apple is getting really close to more of an intermediate-term downtrend and has been under some pressure lately. And Tesla is already in a downtrend. These are three of the big Magnificent Seven stocks that are not looking really good right now. The FANG index is still hanging in there because of the other Magnificent Seven stocks and the other mega caps that are really holding things together currently. The financial sector, it was down slightly, but still in an uptrend. New York Community Bank, yeah, it was up another 5.78%. Again, what? look what a billion dollars will do for you. It'll help raise your stock price. The dollar has been showing some weakness. We're still in a downtrend. And this has been giving some support to stocks as the dollar has been pulling back. We did decline with the 10-year yield. We were up with the 10-year based on price. And then looking at our growth to value ratios, not seeing an awful lot of real improvement here. The Qs to S&P, yeah, they're a little bit above the moving average. This is a disappointment. Discretionary is going down to, when compared to the S&P. Large cap growth compared to large cap value, it turned up, but it's coming right back up to its moving average. So a little bit of an improvement with the large caps, but we're seeing a little bit more strength here with the mid caps and the small caps currently. We're still looking positive with our five-day moving average of the highs minus the lows across the broad market. And we're still extreme positive with our 10-period average of the S&P 500 highs minus the lows. So our outlook, we're positive, but we're setting highs on lower volume. But now we're back to being above that longer-term overhead resistance. And I'm still calling it resistance for now. We haven't been above it long enough to really call it support. And we're supposed to be in a period of weak seasonality, but the market for right now anyway, seems to be ignoring that. The big one is gonna be the employment situation report and the market will be anticipating that to see if it comes in hot, cold, or confusing. And we wanna keep an eye on the different geopolitical events. And here we'll be finishing out the economic calendar. And I just say, employment situation report, but there's a lot of sub reports that come out with that actual report itself. Seasonality, and I finally got the chart to look right this time, where we're neutral to negative with the Dow and NASDAQ, we're just flat out negative with the S&P when we look at March 8th. We'll be on the sixth trading day of the month where we tend to see some negative seasonality, but we've been seeing weak seasonality coming up, but the market keeps going up for right now. And we're also potentially coming into this time of weak seasonality, but the market is just not following that right now. Also, when the setting, sitting president is running for re-election, we often see weakness that to this point just has not developed. Friday is the second most positive day of the week, according to what happened in 2023. We're still in this window now where Tom Bally's research suggests that we might see a pullback, even though the market continues to go up. So the warning signs, growth may be showing some signs of weakness, not so much for the small caps and mid caps, but we're not really seeing it break out right now with the S&P. We still have our list of negative divergences that we've been watching, especially the transports to Dow and S&P. And we're supposed to be in a weak seasonal time, but that's just not happening right now. And our equity put call ratio based on five periods is turning back up. That is positive. The parabolic SAR is positive. The Copic curve is trying to turn positive. The vortex has been declining, but it's still positive. The momentum for the NASDAQ 100, it's trying to cross above its moving average to look more positive. Small and mid cap growth continues to be positive. And even though it was down, the financial sector is still positive. So our conclusion, we're positive. We're setting highs on lower volume. That's a concern. We're above that overhead resistance and we should be in a period of weak seasonality. That's what we're watching. And we're, we're becoming more overbought, but we can stay overbought for extended periods of time in a real positive environment. And we're seeing more of that in the intermediate term and we continue to be extreme positive in the long term. Thank you. I really hope you found this helpful. Have a really good day and I will talk to you in the next video.